Voices, uh, uh, put on by the National Association of Scholars. I'm Scott Turner, the host, and our guest uh, today is uh, Mark P. Mills, who uh, is a uh, is a senior fellow at uh, the Manhattan Institute, also a faculty fellow at uh, Northwestern University in the School of Engineering mm -hmm. and Applied Sciences. Uh, he's been involved for a long time in um, various kinds of uh, business and consulting ventures. Uh, uh, mostly around the issues of technology and uh, energy, and he has special expertise in uh, helping us sort through some of the technical issues of of the uh, of the uh, energy economy of the world. In particular, uh, what realistically is possible in in uh, implementing uh, solar and uh, wind energy, these kinds of uh, renewable things, the impacts of those sorts of uh, uh, things. Um, uh, he's the author of. Uh, several books. Uh, his most recent is called The Cloud Revolution. And the subtitle is quite interesting, how the convergence of new technologies will unleash the next economic boom and a roaring 2020s. And uh, uh, this leads me into uh, what I think is an appropriate uh, uh, transition. He hosts a, a, a podcast uh, titled The Last Optimist, and uh, optimism is something we need uh, quite a bit. And he's the only guest we've had on uh, Restoring the Sciences has actually been on the John Stewart show. So, uh, Mark, Mark, uh, welcome to our our uh, webinar. We're really pleased you're here. Um, you uh, have quite an interesting uh, uh, career. You started off as a physicist and uh, have worked your way through uh, lots of interesting uh, positions. And uh, and uh, just uh, you know, wouldn't you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and and uh, and uh, transition into the your presentation today? Well, thanks for having me. And uh, since Dr. Google allows people to learn more about me than probably I prefer, it's pretty easy to look at my background. But it's very at a very high level abstraction. I've worked in all three domains that may be relevant, having served a century ago in the Reagan White House Science Office. And because I'm at the Manhattan Institute, which is a policy research institute, I have some engagement in policy, public policy. I worked in real research at one time and engineering as well, built things, uh, used my hands to do useful, useful work, have patents. Um, also work in venture. I've been worked in a venture fund uh, that I co-founded. Um, another one I've started recently that uh, a couple of colleagues, we'd focus on software in the energy business. So I've touched on the money world, uh, the politics world, and the engineering world. That's sort of the uh, unholy uh, triangle of the real world, because things don't happen without money, things don't happen without permissions, and things aren't can't happen if you violate the laws of physics. But So engineers have to find work around. So that, that, I, I say that because I've worked in all those areas, and that's sort of what informs how I think about the world. I, I'm not naive about politics being tough. I'm the last optimist because I'm determined as, as a Canadian that emigrated to the United States to continue to believe that the nature of the American experiment is still intact. We, we, we do a lot of political debate have for in this country for two centuries. You know, Americans are very tolerant people. They try things out and then they, you know, there's a lot of sayings about this redound to things that tend to work better than other countries. Not always. So I, and I'm optimistic because the fundamental opportunities for human flourishing are not only in place still, but that's my book's about. I think the pivot that we live at, the potential pivot we live at in history with respect to technology is unique in the sense that we haven't been at a position like this for a century. The 1920s was the last time so many profound changes in underlying technologies and materials and machines and information have occurred simultaneously. But the one thing that hasn't changed very much to the point of our conversation is how we provide primary energy, and food and fuel for society. But there haven't been any revolutions of any foundational nature in that for a long, long time. And uh, they're consequential. Uh, so if you like, what I'll do is put up some slides, maybe do a quick couple minutes for a dozen slides just to paint a, a we'll call it a data picture because I'm very much I have opinions about politics we're all emotional beings but I'm I try to I try to be data driven so let's let's because <laughs> the facts do 
I think the facts matter. Uh, let's see. I think you can see this, right? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do full screen. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, our conversation is animated by the obvious thing, right? The climate, the climate debate. I'm not going to talk about climate change. We can talk about it in the Q and A, except from the perspective that the entire narrative in the phrase energy transition is self-evidently driven and, and animated entirely by climate debate. That's just, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having this conversation about whether there's an energy transition or not, uh, but for the uh, claim that we can rapidly transition away from using hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. So after COP27, I guess the question we could ask is, um, you know, is it a, a transition being accelerated or are we in a, what I would call an energy reset? I'll tell you my bias in advance, as you know, I think we're in for a reset, not a transition. The reason is I think uh, words have meaning, just like facts, and there is no transition underway. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna show you quick, quickly why I don't think one's possible in time frames that are meaningful, but the facts show that there is no energy transition underway if we if we have any sense of what the word transition means. A lot of the commentators uh, on the environmental side after COP27 called it, and I quote, a disaster. And by that, they meant it was a disaster because they didn't get what they wanted. They didn't get an acceleration of the transition or commitments to, quote, do more. The issues that hijacked COP27 were almost entirely issues of energy security, energy reliability, and energy price. And we all know why. It's because we have less secure energy supplies. Prices are high and probably stay high or go higher. And reliability matters. So the word transition. This, this graph should be familiar to almost everybody listening, but if it's not, it's easy data to get. This is just history, the last 30 years of world history of where energy comes from. And the, the two big takeaways from this, this is the world supply of energy from all forms, is that we use more now than we did before, <laughs> a lot more. The, the growth is, uh, is very significant. Slow, slow growth on big, on big systems like the world are meaningful. And the uh, acceleration of spending on wind and solar, which is the almost the entire monomaniacal focus of the so-called energy transition. If you look at the IEA data for transition forecasts, you'll find that about 70% of the net new energy supply imagined for the next 20 years will come from wind and solar. So it's, so it's a wind and solar story. They have some hydrogen in there, and they have some biomass, and they have a little bit of nuclear, but it's a wind solar story. So that's why I focus just for the sake. And it's what we spent most of the money on the last 20 years. So you can see here that the wind solar wedge is now sort of rivaling the hydro, hydro wedge in terms of growth supply of energy to the world, which is not nothing. It's a big world. So 3% of the world's primary energy, about 3.4%, 3.5, comes from wind and solar combined up from nearly zero 20 years ago. So it's significant. But uh, and in the United States, it's about four and a half percent of primary energy. That doesn't look like a rapid transition. I just that's the point of this. It's not, <laughs> and this has cost trillions of dollars. And what's important here in this transition language is that uh, maybe the oldest, not maybe, the oldest source of energy for mankind is burning wood. I mean, other than muscle power of animals and humans, uh, the oldest non non muscle source of energy is burning wood, and wood still provides more than three times more energy globally burning wood, then with all the global wind and solar installations combined. That's a useful calibration just to, in terms of the velocities of things that people pretend are transitions. Even in the United States, wood, burning wood is half as much energy as wood, as wind and solar. And by the way, wood's going to go up a lot in this uh, winter in Europe for reasons you all, everybody understands. Uh, so uh, this is not a rapid transition. That's just the point is and what we find over history is that energy sources are additive. In fact, in absolute terms, if we look at wood, the quantity of wood burned today globally is roughly the same as it was a century ago. We haven't eliminated it. We've just added other stuff to make the world uh, you know, more comfortable. I want to show you this graph. This is not my graph. It's a, rep it's, you know, it's a direct screen capture, redraw of a graph from an excellent article. If you all haven't seen this, I can give you guys a, a citation, but... This is, this is probably the most important way to look at food and fuel. Food and fuel are the same thing, fuel for humans and animals, and, and which is food and 
and fuel the fuel society. This is the share of GDP of global economies devoted to acquiring food and fuel over the last 700 years, seven centuries. The only thing that's remarkable about this is the biggest, I would, I would argue, achievement in human history has been in the radical reduction in the share of economies that are devoted to spending money on food and fuel. And the collapse came, you can see they map one to one with the dawn of the industrial revolution and the beginning of the combustion of coal. And then the transition to, this is in percentage terms, not absolute terms, of course, the percentage of, of uh, money spent on oil and, and gas, the other hydrocarbons. Uh, so the world on average spends 10 to 15% of all of its GDP acquiring food and fuel. And it used to spend 70 to 80%. So even if the world economy didn't grow, this would tell you something. The money that's freed up is helps to make the environment cleaner, get healthcare, do things like education and entertainment. Uh, there's probably no single more important transition in human history than the transition to pushing the cost of food and fuel into the twilight. Uh, so as a, another calibration point, at, the, at this moment in the Western world, for the first time since 1980, the cost of energy is risen to about 20% of the GDP, which is close to double what it was over the last um, 40 years. And it's it's now echoing what it was in, in uh, when Jimmy Carter lost the presidency because of energy price escalation. And, and I just given, you know, you're in Namibia, so you know this, that there's there's a good data on the, you know, energy costs directly linked to food costs, food costs linked directly to political instability. There's a one-to-one -one correlation over a long history. This is just a nice graph from Statista over the last 20 years showing what happens when food prices, food riots occur. And they, they, they will, this is sort of, maybe you could say it's predictive. We're entering 2022 in a similar uh, dynamic, I, I, I think it's going to lead to political unrest. It's not a forecast I happily make. So let's talk about the transition, what it would take. So the world gets 84% of all its energy from hydrocarbons today. 20 years ago, the world got 86% of all its energy from hydrocarbons. Two percentage point decline over 20 years after spending $5 trillion. So it's, again, not a fast transition. If we want to make the transition faster, this is the proposed transition to zero low carbon technologies. Let's flip the picture and look at, this is a bar chart at the bottom. You can see the uh, share, not of the world's energy from hydrocarbons, but rather the share of world's energy from non-hydrocarbons. So that's, the, that's the, from 1965 to date. And you can see it's been growing. This is nuclear, this is wind and solar, this is you know biofuels. Uh, to get to that share being 100% by 2050, the stated goal of many of the advocates of a quote transition, that's the first blue line. To make that happen, uh, just a, a sense of the construction projects that are required. Because if you think of this in terms of it's just a, a physical activity, it requires building stuff. You got to build wind turbines, you got to build batteries, you got to build solar arrays, you got to pour concrete, you got to make steel. So let's do this in, in a sense. And I give Roger Pilkey credit for this sort of this graph and, and formulation. If you think about it in nuclear power plant terms, to get 100% by 2050, we'd have to build one 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant. That's one nuclear power plant that provides electricity in the Western world for half a million people. In Africa, one nuclear plant would, of course, supply electricity for 2 million people or more. But one nuclear power plant will have to be built every single day for the next 30 years. We're not, we're not, we're not building one a day. That's 365 power, nuclear power plants a year for 30 years. Uh, that's a hell of a construction project. If I put it in windmill terms, since that's the preferred uh, modality, for, that would be a thousand windmills a day, each the size of the Washington Monument, three megawatt windmills for 30 years. And to keep the lights on with batteries, because you're going to use windmills this the, and wind, solar power. I have to build a gigafactory every day. There's a picture of the British gigafactory. I have to build one of those every day for 30 years. Each of those costs $3 billion. Each of those consumes $2 to $3 billion worth of chemicals a year to make batteries. That's an astonishing velocity in construction. I, there's no evidence that's going on. There's no evidence that the world can do that. But that's what would be required to transition. So if we look now at a different problem, which is maybe the, this is the, in a sense, the principal roadblock to the aspirations, it's the minerals requirements to build all this stuff. 
and this is not my data, I just want to remind everybody, this is the International Energy Agency data, UN data, World Bank data, uh, USGS data. There's lots of organizations have studied the mineral requirements to build machines. Uh, this is a, a, a compilation of IEA data, bundling all the metals that you need, nickel, uh, co cobalt, copper, you know, uh, manganese, neodymium, all the whole melange into two buckets, copper and everything else. The important point is that the to build the same uh, power capacity uh, with a windmill or a solar array instead of with a gas turbine, you need to increase the quantity of metals mined by a thousand to two thousand percent. That's for power capacity. For energy delivery, you have to double or triple that, depending on where in the world you put these things. So you have a roughly 2,000 to 3,000 percent call on increased metal requirements per unit of energy delivered to society, per mile of driving, per unit of heat, per unit of light. Uh, if you replace the hydrocarbon machines with windmills, solar arrays, and batteries. And for electric cars, you should know that the metals requirement to build an electric car are about four to 500 percent more per car than building a conventional car. Uh, the minerals are dominated by copper. It's electric after all. You have electric motors and electric batteries, <laughs> but it's but it requires the other minerals. That you've heard lots about lithium and you know manganese, and also requires more uh, uh, a, a whole uh, the whole suite of uh, of minerals that are used to, to fabricate things, including including semiconductors. So the semiconductor load for an electric car is roughly two hundred percent greater than for a conventional car. Again, because you're controlling power with semiconductors. So the IEA has looked at the implications of this mineral demand on uh, the global supply of minerals and pointed out, again, this is an IEA graph, that the world will have to increase its production compared to today's level of production of minerals by these quantities to meet the transition goals to 2040. Goals would still leave the world getting two thirds of its energy from hydrocarbons, by the way. This is not eliminating hydrocarbon goals. These are goals that would reduce hydrocarbons consumption by about 20 or 30 percentage points. So what we what we need is 700% more rare earths mined, 2000% more nickel mined, 2000% more cobalt, almost 3000% more graphite. For those of you who don't know anything about the mining industry, uh, these, these levels of increase in supply of, of minerals have never happened in 20 years. Uh, they they can happen over a century or two centuries, but they've never happened in 20 years. These are uh, uh, these are astonishing increases in mineral demands, of uh, the likes of which have never been oppressed uh, on the world. In fact, the IEA has said that we need hundreds of new mines to meet the transition goals. Hundreds of new mines, not a few. And if you want to think about it, at what this means in terms of holes in the ground, let's just take again. Uh, we'll take copper because copper is the oldest mine metal. Uh, in human history. We know lots about copper. We know two things about copper. It take very big mines to get the quantities of copper required. This is the world's biggest copper mine in Chile, the picture on the right. You can see that tiny little patch at the top right of the hole is a town. Give you a sense of how big the hole is. Uh, we're gonna need dozens of mines like that to be built and open, which now don't exist or aren't planned. In fact, the graph on the left shows you the world demand for copper for the electric vehicle transition. Never mind everything else. And the dark blue line is the current supply of copper from the world from all, all existing sources. And the light blue line is the expected supply of copper from mines that are announced or planned or under construction. The obvious takeaway from this graph is in a couple of years from now, right around 2024, assume everybody builds the mines they've announced they're gonna build and do the expansion they've announced they're gonna expand, the world will be short copper. Not for a hundred percent transition, I will say it again, but short, be short copper by 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 virtue of just attempting to make a partial expansion towards eliminating hydrocarbons. IEA has pointed out that the average time to open a new mine globally is 16 years. I dare say in the United States, I say this facetiously and truthfully, the time is infinite. Um, this administration canceled three mines this year, one copper mine and two nickel mines, two copper mines and a nickel mine. Nickel is essential, by the way, for the electric vehicle future. Uh, and as it stands today, uh, the world is the world's mining industry has more capital committed to expanding expanding coal mines than all of the rest of the mineral mines combined. Just again, this is not whether it's good or bad. For those who don't like those things, that's a fact. <laughs> you can say you can look at all the other metals, lithium. You can look at for obvious reasons for lithium batteries. We need about 20 more mines opened 
Uh, remember, we need these mines open not in the average of 16 years. We need them open in the next decade and providing minerals because we have goals that will require these 20 mines to exist in five years, not 16 or 20 years. That's the world's biggest lithium mine. Uh, it's not a brine mine. It's in Western Australia. It's another big hole in the ground. Uh, Australia is the biggest supplier of lithium to the world. And it's got lots of lithium there. It's not like they can't get more lithium. The issue here is whether or not anybody's investing enough money to do it. The uh, blue, dark blue line in this case is the demand for lithium for the imagined electric vehicle transition. And the red line is the supply in the blue bars. So obviously we have a, we have a, we have a, uh, a challenge supplying the lithium. This is why lithium is up 900% in cost. Same is true of nickel. Uh, the world's not building enough nickel mines. We will probably need 50 to 100 nickel, new nickel mines. But if you did it in terms of the world's biggest nickel mine, you need a couple dozen of the world's biggest nickel mines uh, built. The biggest one is in Indonesia. Uh, again, the uh, red line is the planned. Uh, the blue line is the demand for nickel for electric vehicles, not just for the energy transition. Wood McKenzie has uh, done us a favor of showing a, uh, a history and a forecast, recent history, going back only uh, three years, a recent history and forecast going out to the year 2030 of global capital spending in billions of dollars. The y-axis is billions of dollars. Uh, global capital spending on mines, metal mines, uh, for different metals, aluminum, copper, gold. You need lots of aluminum for the energy transition, by the way. For those of you who don't know this, you probably do, the battery in an electric car weighs a half a ton. That's to replace uh, a gasoline tank that weighs 80 pounds. So to offset that, you need to use lots of aluminum in the body of the car to, uh, to you know, not have the car weigh a half ton more. So all electric cars weigh more than their counterparts, but they weigh about 500 pounds more on average. Some of them weigh a half ton more. Just depends on how much aluminum, how much money you want to spend on aluminum. The world is not mining enough aluminum, by the way, either to meet these transition goals. Aluminum prices are 200% higher than they were three years ago because of the demand for aluminum in the quote energy transition already when we're at, we're at a world which still hasn't got more than 0.6% of all vehicles are electric powered today. After this excitement about the rapid ex expansion of electric vehicles, we haven't hit one, we haven't broached the 1% of vehicles and we've already pushed aluminum prices up 200%. What, what McKenzie is showing here with the hashed lines to the right is the amount of capital investment that would be required uh, to meet the demands for copper, aluminum, lithium, and nickel uh, to meet the goals that are proposed, not to get rid of 100% of oil and gas, but just the goals proposed for electric vehicles and windmills and solar arrays. Uh, what you can see is the solid colors are the actual commitments made by the world's mining companies. This is not half enough. It's not, it's not you know, they're not investing half what we need. They aren't investing 10% of what's needed. Uh, there's, I have an opinion as to why that's the case, but you know, that's just the fact of where it is. If we think about supply chain issues with respect to the energy transition and its call on energy minerals, the thing you want to have to have in mind is what we don't use oil and gas, a liquid and a, and, a, and, a, and a gaseous energy. We're switching to solids, you know, copper, nickel, aluminum. That's the energy trade is a trade from solids, from so gases and liquids to solids. And the solids are minerals that are mined somewhere, not in America. This is the this is IEA data again. The principal the principal mining locations for most of the these these are sort of. Five examples, I could put all the metals here and the picture looks the same. What's important about the energy minerals is the right side is where they're refined. Minerals are like oil. You don't put crude oil in your car or an airplane, you refine it to make diesel fuel or gasoline. You have to refine copper and lithium, cobalt, all the rare earths. Uh, China has a market share in um, refining energy minerals that's double OPEC's market share in providing oil to the world. So this, huge increase in demand for metals to build these energy machines, windmills, again, solar arrays, solar arrays and batteries, has increased the cost of the inputs. And what it's done, and which has been largely ignored, is increased the cost of the machines. It should, it should be unsurprising. If, if, as I showed you in the early graph, the quantity of metals you need to build a unit of power with wind, solar, and batteries is up 1,000 to 3,000%. Then, if you if you get you get mineral price inflation, then you should expect the mineral price inflation to reflect itself in the cost of the machines you're building with those minerals, and we have so this narrative that energy from wind, solar, and uh, electric cars is getting cheaper. The machines are getting cheaper. Is it true? It did get cheaper. It stopped getting cheaper two years ago, not because of the COVID lockdowns, but because of the demand for these metals. 
as a uh, as a way to understand why this why this has had such a big impact, maybe it's not surprising, but here's a fact: about seventy percent of the cost to make a battery is in the, the metals and minerals you buy to make the battery, not in the manufacturing, not in the electronics, in the raw materials for solar arrays. 70% of the cost of making a solar module is in the materials that go into it. For a wind uh, turbine, it's about 30%, maybe 40% of the cost. So as you get price escalation on the inputs, that's not just 10 or 20%. We're talking two to 300% price escalation for most of these metals in the last few years, 600 to 800% for lithium. What you would expect if you increase, by do your arithmetic here, if I increase by 200%, call it half, half of the input cost, at some point you're going to get 100% increase in the cost of the product. So you're getting you're getting uh, pressure pushing up. The reason it hasn't had as big an impact yet is because these things are sort of slow motion disasters, right? They, they You have a contract for nickel that is running two years. It expires. Your next, your next pound of nickel is going to cost you 200% more. And that's the world that we're living in. So what this means is that the, the, the future costs of wind, solar, and batteries are now almost entirely determined by mining. Not by clever subsidies and lobbying, but by mining. That's important. So guessing what the future costs of wind, solar, and batteries are going to be for the world is really a guess about the future of mining. It's important to keep in mind that every forecast, every single one, every forecast is predicated on wind, solar, and batteries getting cheaper. That's not happening. Now, we have to be honest about what the implications are of that not happening and how we could make it happen, but it's not happening and no one's being honest. The other thing not being honest about is the environmental implications of all that mining. There's two implications of all the mining. One we can talk about in Q&A, which is you're displacing the environmental challenges of amassing mining infrastructure out of highly regulated environments like Europe and North America into poorly regulated and fragile environments, politically fragile environments, ecologically fragile environments in South America in Africa, that's in South Asia. That's where the mining is going on. That's where the expansions are occurring dominantly. I think that's a challenge, frankly, if you're an environmentalist, I think it's a moral challenge. There's all kinds of problems with this, but there's there's no, I, I'm a huge fan of trading with these countries. I just think we have to be honest about where the trade's going. The other thing we have to be honest about, honest about is the energy and CO2 impacts of this. So not just the environmental impacts of clean water, clean air, ecosystem fragility, but it is a fact that the mining industry uses lots of energy. It's particularly oil and coal and natural gas. These are big machines. They, they last 40 years or longer. And when you build a car, again, a thousand pound battery, you have to dig up 500,000 pounds of the earth to get the minerals you need to make that one battery. That digging up and processing those materials all involves diesel, fuel, coal to make electricity, especially where the mines are located, and natural gas to process the chemicals and make the chemicals. That means that electric vehicle isn't zero emissions. It just emits elsewhere. Now, everybody knows the elsewhere is typically at the power plant. It depends on where you live in the world and when you charge your electric car. And I should... I should uh, I should uh, digress briefly. I like electric cars. <laughs> There's going to be lots more electric cars in the world. Electric cars are amazing. Tesla's amazing. Elon Musk deserves a lot of credit. He he frightened, shocked, and inspired the entire world automotive industry. Good for him. Uh, impressive. Probably the best engineered battery so far in the, in the world. Again, good for him. But I'm, I, that, And there'll be lots more electric cars in the future because we're rich in the West and we like electric cars. We're going to buy lots of them, even without subsidies. And you can't explain away the Tesla success on subsidies. People don't buy $90,000 cars. You've got to be pretty wealthy to buy a $90,000 car. If it's a crappy car and somebody gives you a $5,000 or $7,000 discount, it's, it's not going to happen. It's a good car. So let's put that aside. Building an electric battery that weighs 1,000 pounds requiring digging up 500,000 pounds of the earth means that that activity emits CO2. Obvious fact. So this is a graph from Volkswagen, and God bless them for publishing it at their website. They have the whole study published there, but this is their mid-case study showing that at mile zero, when the, when the electric vehicle is delivered to your driveway compared to the diesel SUV, it's already emitted 12 tons of CO2. The manufacturing of diesel, uh, a diesel-powered SUV leads to emissions of CO2 because the steel, the plastics make that car, about five tons of CO2. 
So what they're showing you is they begin to drive this vehicle in Europe and charging on a European grids, which are full of windmills and solar arrays, that by about 65 to 70,000 miles, you finally, if you drive the EV, you finally reach a point where you've emitted less CO2 than just buying a diesel SUV in the first place. So that means at the end of the useful life of the vehicle, you've saved some CO2. That looks in this, this model, it's about 20% reduction. That's not nothing, but it's not zero. <laughs> it's not, and it's not significant. More important, if if you source the materials from different places, because we don't know where they're being sourced, it's a pretty opaque world. The range of CO2 emissions from manufacturing the battery for this vehicle ranges from a low of 10 tons to a high of 30. So if you happen to have built an electric vehicle, sourcing the materials from parts of the world where the ore is, is uh, further away, where the ore grade is poorer because of the price pressures to get enough copper, enough, again, manganese and nickel, you'll end up having an SUV with a battery or a car with a battery delivered to your driveway that will result over the lifespan of you using that vehicle in the world, seeing more CO2 emitted to it. It's, that's not a an insult about SUVs or an insult about diesels or about electric cars. It's just a fact. Batteries will get better. That's what the first people are. People all, all the batteries will get better. They will get better. And if the batteries get better, you use better means higher energy density batteries use less material fewer pounds per unit of electricity stored, which means you mine less stuff, which reduces the CO2 burden of the battery. Okay, true. And then we hear really silly statements made by otherwise very smart people that clean tech batteries and wind and solar are, are gonna wipe fossil fuels off the market because they're following sort of an exponential process like the, like the growth of, of uh, computers and cell phones and telecommunications. This is, this is an analogy that's not just incorrect and it's not just wrong. It's actually silly. Uh, only in science fiction and in comic books do, do energy systems improve at the rate of information systems. This is a graph of the Moore's law rate, which is a red line, if it were applied to batteries. This is what, would, what it would look like. The graph you see with the blue dots here is the actual rate of improvement for lithium batteries after they were first commercialized. They were invented in the mid 70s, first discovered by an Exxon chemist, Exxon, Exxon chemist, I emphasize that, who got a Nobel <laughs> Prize with two others in the mid 70s. It took about 15 years to commercialize the batteries. Sony was the first one that did it. And then the batteries got better. Their energy density improved by about two and a half fold, 250% improvement. And then starting roughly when Elon Musk was able to use those batteries to make a car, uh, they've gotten a little better. That's the blue line, as you can see, tr trending up. Then it started trending down because it turns out things like safety and manufacturability and costs matter. And as you chase all those metrics, the actual energy densities erode. What I'm showing you on this graph at the far right is the target uh, for energy density for batteries based on the best available technologies that we can imagine deploying in the next decade. And of course, the theoretical possibility of going to extremely high energy density batteries, lithium metal batteries, which exist, they're just not commercially viable. And, the, and they, 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 could, they could be built eventually, almost certainly not by 2030, but possibly. But again, not a Moore's law rate. And even if we got there, what that would, would do is re reduce by 30 or 40% the call on metals, which is not nothing, but it's a 30 or 40% reduction on the call on metals against an overall demand increase of 3,000 to 6,000%. So instead of a 3,000% increase in demand for metals, we'll have only a 2,500% increase in demand for metals. Irrelevant. Let me wrap up with a couple just quick observations about the challenge we have in an energy transition. So the, Russia has sort of x-rayed the problem with the making grids more fragile by using uh, too much wind and solar uh, and depending on unreliable sources of, of, of natural gas, in particular in oil. So you, you, you've all, you, we're all following what's going on there. But what you need to know is that Europe is not solving the problem by surging windmills or surging batteries or surging solar arrays. They're surging LNG. They're surging oil from other places. They're surging coal is what they're doing to survive this uh, problem they've got with dependence on energy from Russia and not having a system that they built that can surge any other way. You can't surge windmills. To give a sense of the scale of what they'd have to do, even if they wanted to surge, so Russia supplies about 20% of all the world's energy. 
just it, it provides 70 percent of the world's uh, natural gas and 12 percent of the world's oil so it's 17 percent of the world's and 20 percent of the world's energy uh, remember the first graph i showed you wind and solar today are about three percent of the world's energy so we we would have to you know increase wind and solar by 600 percent sixfold at least to just to displace the share of energy that we get from russia that we don't want to buy from russia anymore not crazy not impossible not going to happen in a decade or two though what is going to happen in the next decade is oils and gas are going to get expensive. And that's because people who have been opposing and convincing and banning uh, oil and gas companies from spending money on exploration got their wish. They started to get their wish around 2015, seven years ago. The dark blue line is the global investment in exploration and production by the world's 1,200 energy companies that work in oil and gas. The solid blue line is the world's demand for oil and gas. And you can see something that's important here. Demand hasn't changed very much except for a brief dip from massive global lockdowns. But supply, which is predicted by exploration and production, is going to start shrinking very soon. This this guarantees higher prices. I mean, there's no other or guarantees uh, recessions to tamp down demand or 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 both, which is called stagflation. So it's not a good situation to be in. These energy policies have put the world on the cusp of some very worrisome uh, trajectories with respect to energy price, energy reliability, energy availability. And it is physically impossible to, quote, surge the preferred technologies of wind, solar, and batteries at the scales imagined to replace oil, gas, and coal. On the other hand, it's physically possible, in fact, relatively speaking, easy to surge the oil and gas sector. In technical terms, it is clearly not easy to surge it in political terms. And that is that is sort of the, the state of the world we're in. The people most impacted by this, uncomplicated. I'll end on one last profoundly obvious observation. The Western world will find it very unpleasant to live in an environment where average energy prices stay where they are or go higher because we're now spending nearly twice as much as a share of GDP on oil and gas and coal and electricity in the Europe and US combined. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we're, we're rich. Uh, the 6 billion people who live on much thinner economic margins than we do will, will not find it, will not find this comfortable. In fact, it will, it will sadly uh, cause uh, increase, I suspect in, in famines, it, the food, food prices are, are directly tied to energy prices, uh, not just because of fertilizer costs, but because of distribution costs. Food is bulky, requires trucks and tractors and ships and aircraft for emergencies. So this is a profoundly immoral trade. In my view. I guess the thing that I find most offensive about this is not that it's a silly trade technologically, not that we can't do different di things different in the long run than we're doing today, but in the time frames we're talking about, two decades, it's it's a it's a silly trope to think we're making a great transition, but it's immoral, in my view, to do what we're doing to the cost of energy for the world's poor. If the world's rich want to pay more for energy, all right, okay. I mean, tax the rich, I guess. But we were, we're what we're not that's not what we're doing. We're taxing the poor. So I'll end there. Thank you. Uh thank you, Mark, uh, for that uh uh, I was I, I wrote down a phrase uh, uh, depressingly optimistic uh, uh, soberly optimistic uh, uh, in part be, the, the the optimism obviously comes from uh, the, the fact that we can actually uh, make people wealthy even the poorest people yes yeah. Uh, firsthand, but uh... I think um, I'm afraid, Scott, your your African Wi-Fi might be getting jittery on us. I can't. Uh, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the 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 gods of the internet uh, uh, prevail uh, everywhere. Um, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but uh, you know we've just come off of the COP27 um, uh, extravaganza, and 
you see in stark terms uh, this idea that somehow to save the world, and this is all virtue signaling. This is where the uh, the I'm, I'm I was very pleased to hear you actually use the word immoral because it actually is. But but uh, the price of the, our virtue signaling is that we're actually condemning huge parts of the world right. to continued poverty, continued starvation, uh, uh, stunted economic development in in the parts of the world that need it actually uh the most and you know i was i was listening to your um your uh your laying out of uh, unavoidable facts and the kinds of things we see coming from uh cop 27 are just delusional it seems to me i i i don't see how any rational person can 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 look at the things that you have laid out and and come to any other uh conclusion that than uh what was going on at cop 27 was 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 immoral um the um one of the interesting things that happened there is that you had the president of the african union who is actually president of Senegal, uh, actually very, very tentatively saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe you should let us uh, develop our fossil fuels. And the response mm -hmm. to that, of course, is this activist campaign, don't gas Africa, which was, uh, you know, which was obviously uh, uh, ginned up on, on, on the spur of the moment. And, and so what is it that is driving this delusion, do you think? You know, why, why can't we talk sense about energy and economic development and uh, <laughs> these kinds of things? What's what's the barrier? So this takes us out of the domains of physics into the domains of psychology, both political psychology and human psychology, where the, the former one, I feel very comfortable stating things that I know are facts. I mean, it is a fact that an electric car uses two to three hundred percent more copper than a regular car, and you can't change that fact. You just can't. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. use something other than copper. It's not replaceable. Is a is a conductor. Aluminum is a lousy conductor. Those voltages. So you're going to use more copper. It's a fact. We aren't mining enough copper. It's a fact. So the, to, to your point, it really is puzzling, and it's delusional to believe that we could make enough electric cars for the world for the west forget let's get to africa in a minute that the west could make enough electric cars in the time frames that are imagined because even if we decide to pillage africa for the copper in south america which is where we'll go because where the chinese are going as you know um if even if we decided to start tomorrow we won't be mining enough copper in the time frames that are imagined for these bans on on internal combustion engines so you scratch your head. So I, I mean, the most puzzling one is not, is not. I understand why people feel this aspiration that we have to do something because of climate change and the forecast. I, I get that, I'm, and I'm not going to dispute their their believing that we have to do it. Okay, let's just stipulate. I don't think we have to do it, and it has nothing to do with being a denier about climate change. It has to do with, I think the consequences are less severe than they think. I think the data show that. I think the, the IPCC reports actually show that. But let's just say we can agree to disagree that you, th you not you, but one thinks mm -hmm. it's an apocalypse coming and the others think it's not an apocalypse. It doesn't matter. We're not mining enough copper. It just doesn't matter. So the, then you have to ask yourself, well, what, do you, what are you thinking? Why? What's the alternative? I mean, if, well, the alternative first order is enough money to build resilience into societies. If you really believe, if you, in your heart of hearts, believe the science says that we're going to have all these negative effects from uh, unpleasant weather and attacks from, you know, nature is going to really do bad things to us. And nature has been trying to kill humans for all of history. I mean, that's what nature does. <laughs> We have to, you know, nature doesn't care about us. Nature, you know, whether it's earthquakes or volcanoes, cyclones, that money and technology are what insulate us from nature. So in order to get more insulation from nature that we think is going to get worse, and it might, whether or not we do anything to make it worse, it's perfectly reasonable to assume we need more resilience. That takes money and technology. So squandering money on delivering more expensive energy robs money, the precious resource from building resilience. I find that immoral, delusional. But it, it, before I come to Africa, the, it, is, it is, continues to be a puzzle. So I don't have a good answer, except uh, uh, it, there's a momentum in political systems. This is not new to our time, to a belief set. People get locked into a belief set, something they feel they have to do 
whether it's morally or emotionally, whether it's because they're kleptocrats, whether because it's what they do for a living, it's how they make, they, you know, they sell solar arrays, they install, and they want to feel good about selling solar arrays, and they're doing mm -hmm. it to save the world, not to make electricity. Solar arrays really matter where you are, as you know, you, you know, I talked about it. They make a mm -hmm. difference. A much, there are great, hybridizing solar arrays with diesel generators is magical. It changes how people can live. And the solar arrays means you can use a lot less diesel fuel, which is also magical because of high maintenance and transport costs for diesel and the emissions, all, all, all good. Uh, but you can't run up. Unless we could take that model for the whole world and say that how much you can use solar versus diesel just depends on where you live, what latitude you're in, as well as the, you know, the, the weather patterns. We know that data. In fact, that data is calculable. We know exactly what we could do. We know it wouldn't result in the world not using hydrocarbons. It would be highly, it would reduce the quantity of hydrocarbons. We'd still need an awful lot. So what would you do? Well, I would want Africa to have cheap hydrocarbons. And if we mm -hmm. want to make, because they use a lot less than us because they're poorer. Mm -hmm. So let's make their hydrocarbons cheap. And if we want to spend more money on our energy, we can volunteer to do that. Uh, but we could do both. I mean, in principle, I'm just speaking philosophically, there's a future in which we could have cheap oil for Africa, cheap natural gas for Africa, and their quantities of consumption are so trivial compared to our quantities of consumption. Though I wish we ban them from using it, we could reduce our use of it by a pro, pro rata equivalent amount by paying lots more for other stuff voluntarily. We don't have to subsidize Africa that way. We, we, we can subsidize ourselves, if you like, selfishly. Uh, up to a point, we could do a lot of that. And Maybe that'd be a moral, uh, you know, I, I could get on board uh, with people volunteering to do that. And Americans in particular, a lot of Europeans are, are good hearted. They might actually volunteer. They're told this is the trade. We're not sending dollars to Africa where we can't trace them. We're going to implement a policy where we're going to send cheap oil from a, the shale fields of the Permian Basin to Africa. And we're going to help them drill for oil offshore there because they got a lot of oil there. And mm. we'll make sure it's cheap for them. This would be a great trade. And if you're a climateista, if you're really, really worried about the climate, I mean, then you should have this number in your head. China's increased coal consumption in the last five years, and therefore their increased CO2 emissions just from coal consumption, is a greater addition of CO2 to the world than England emitted since the Industrial Revolution. So China's few years, if, if China wants to play this game as well, and maybe they would, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so, but mm -hmm. I'm just, <laughs> this opinion, not fact. So, mm -hmm. but I know it is puzzling. I really, like the IEA, it's a long answer, but it's a really important question. The IEA is the, is the chief uh, architect and progenitor of the transition aspiration. It's gone from being an information agency to an advocacy agency, which I think is a problem. It should be broken up and defunded for that reason alone, or re re restructured to go back to its mission, which the post oil embargo of 73, 74 was to provide international data for us to do planning, not to be an mm -hmm. advocacy. So they're advocating for a transition. I, I, it's shocking and, and depressing. But at the same time, that agency has issued with, well, with no publicity, extraordinarily good analyses on what I talked about. I use their data on the metal mm -hmm. demands and the mining demands. Very honest stuff, really honest stuff. Good for them, but they don't publicize them. I mean, I think uh, I may be one of six people on the planet that's publicizing their data <laughs> to their chagrin, probably, I guess. Mm -hmm. But you, if you want to know more about this, go to the free, go to the IEA website, uh, go spelunking for their two reports on energy minerals, and it's 300 pages as one, and it goes 250 pages, chock-a-block full of data. They're pointing out that the energy and emissions associated with the next marginal ton of copper are going up, not down. Uh, they're pointing to the problem of mining, the water problem, the pollution problems, the labor problems, the child abuse problems. They're, they're doing all that. Good on them. But the policymakers, it's as, like, it's as if those reports didn't even exist. Why? Because they have an agenda, they have a political agenda, uh, and I'm not trying to make it like a, some sort of Orwellian political agenda. They want to control us. I'll, I'll just, I'll accept for the sake of argument that they really mean good. They really want. They really think they're saving the planet a hundred years from now. They really believe that. And they think we have to just try. And I've had people who I think are honest people who are not kleptocrats or dishonest, who say things like, "We just have to try." And, and my answer to that: well, well, why would you try something that you know is not going to work? And worse than that, hurt people and cost money. 
Why yeah. would you do that? Crazy. Yeah. It's delusional. Yeah. That's why I call my last report the, the, the energy transition delusion. It really yeah. is. Yeah. You, you can yeah. tell that I that I might have mild opinions about the about yes. so it's yeah. it's just crazy. I, it's because yeah. the facts are there. I look tell me where the facts are wrong. Show me, show me what I got wrong. You, you the electric car uses less copper, show me the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roger Pilkey has made a very similar point. You know, you, you know, looking at uh, the different kinds of uh, of, of uh, climate scenarios, for example. Right. You know, right. as we've got better at predicting the uh, the the, uh, the 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 climate scenarios, have become more and more optimistic, and yet. Right. In all the politics and all the policy making, people consistently go to the worst case scenario, and it's not because of an abundance of caution. Because this worst case scenario has actually been undermined and uh, discredited by by increasing knowledge. But but it's 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 the pursuit of political power and uh, and uh, and uh, also a pretty significant degree of of uh, of uh, virtue signaling, in my view. You know, and and uh, you know we were talking briefly about uh, uh, Africa and 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 here's another fun fact you know the the uh, the the country of Namibia where I am accounts for 0.003 percent of total carbon emissions and yet as a result of the Kyoto protocol and also you know the kind of uh, handouts from developing nations that were developed nations that were handed out in 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 uh, um, at uh, uh, COP27, uh, it, Namibia has been bought off to 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 say, well, we'll we'll reduce our carbon emissions, which are already minuscule, by ninety one percent. That's their national commitment, and and uh, uh, of course, what's really at play there is the payments that are being made right. from develop, develop, developed right. countries into developing countries. And of course, with those yeah. payments comes control. And this is something that China actually does very, very well. You know, China yeah. is a big colonial presence here. And, and uh, um, yeah. you know, yet Namibia has ample natural gas reserves to power the country for another two centuries they are finding right. lots of lots of petroleum they have enormous reserves of uranium and could uh, actually power their country uh, into the foreseeable future by building three nuclear power plants for the for the country and uh, uh, and yet it's not done it's not done because uh, uh, the uh, the national interests have been bought off by the developing world by the sorry, I beg your pardon the the, the uh, interests of the developing countries have been bought off by the developed world. Right. And uh, right. again, this is imposing our virtue on someone else. It's really a kind of green colonialism uh, yeah. based as, 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 uh, on, on as exploitative, exploitative a model as the, as the bad old colonialism during the scramble for uh, Africa. Okay, uh, Mark, they're, they're, they, we have lots of uh, interesting questions coming in. Um, the uh, um, the uh, uh, we like people to uh, put things into the Q and A, but several questions have come in through the chat. So, so let's just briefly let me just briefly go through the uh, the, the the ones that are on the chat uh, uh, section sure. and before, before we can get into the Q and A uh, session. So. Um, uh, Keith Whitaker um, uh, would like you to describe why you're an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of my uh, favorite questions I got at a book interview was, uh, okay, you say they're going to have a roaring 2020, so just tell me when the roaring starts. <laughs> <laughs> so here's why I'm an optimist. Um, it, it, I think that people by and large – in most most and most democratic societies, so I stipulate that this applies to democratic societies, which will will infect the other societies productively in in time. Often, not perfect. Don't like uh, the costs of things going up and reliability declining, and they will vote with their behavior. They'll change their opinions. Now it might take time. It's not like it's going to happen overnight. I'm not pretending there aren't other issues, but. When they become consequential, people will react, and they have before, and they will again. 
So the reason I'm optimistic is I think they will react before too long. And it's not, and again, I'm not optimistic that it will happen tomorrow or the next election necessarily, but in the relatively near future, uh, in 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 Europe and in the West, and it's already happening in Europe, by the way, it's a, the Europeans are already changing their behavior, not rhetorically, but actual in actual fact. So burning more coal, <laughs> which will tell you something in Europe, they're they're building LNG terminals. Germany just built an LNG import terminal, which they said they would never build. They started construction in April this year because of the invasion in March. They knew then what was going to happen. It's pretty obvious. It's online. Think about this. This is a this, this is an industrial scale LNG import terminal that we would take here five years to permit, beg for permission to open. I mean, we, we realistically we build them in you know two or three years here, but in six seven months. That's what you could, that's called surgery, baby, but it's LNG. So mm. why do they do that? And, and they're doing more of those. And why are they building pipelines? Why are they, why are they hunting the world for oil? Why are they, because behind closed doors, they've asked the question and gotten the answer, you know, will we, will we deindustrialize or stay an industrial nation or nation? And the answer is no, if they don't get more oil, gas and, and coal, metallurgical coal in particular. So they're they're behaviorally doing the right thing, which is good. So I'm an optimist. But here's the reason I'm optimist fundamentally. The, the things that we're facing, the problems that we're facing are actually resolvable with the, and I'll use President Obama's line, with the stroke of a pen. I can't change the law in physics with the stroke of a pen. So stroke of a pen, the ban internal combustion engines, go ahead. I'll take the bet. The bans will disappear. I just, I'll, I'll take that bet. The bans are in 2030. That's seven years away soon. I hope God willing, I'll be around. I'll take, you want to make a bet on this? I'll take the bet. And real dollars, cougarons, not Bitcoins, because uh, <laughs> I'll win the bet. They'll be functionally gutted or they'll be eliminated because they can't do it. And people will revolt because it'll cause a, cause a shortage of cars as the cost of used cars will soar. So that's what a stroke of a pen, however, governments everywhere can get lots more energy. And when they do the stroke of the pen, which they've done in Egypt, which they've done in Turkey, which they've done in Lebanon, and <laughs> Beirut, right? They, which they've done in Ghana, Guyana, rather, which they've done in, all over the world. Different, by the way, Putin just did that, just committed to increase production. Oil production in Russia today is higher than it was a year ago, not lower, higher. And they just did that in um, in UAE. The UAE has just committed $150 billion, stroke of a pen to produce more gas and oil. And it will produce more oil and gas and soon because we can't. What we can't, the things I know we can't do, we can't, we can't open copper mines that fast. We'll open more of them. So the stroke of the pen part matters. And that's why, and once we do that, once politicians decide to, to sign the legislation that has to be signed, whatever country it's in, we'll have more in cheap energy. Cheap energy matters. Uh, cheap energy unleashes the money going elsewhere for environmental protection, for innovation. The other reason I'm optimistic is that, and I write about this in my book, I think the velocity with which we can do other things, including expand mines, is probably faster. So I, I cite the IEA's data, the 16 years, because it's it's their data. I, I think they're, this is where I think they're pessimistic. I think we can probably make that eight years. I think we can cut it in half. Uh, I think the combination of artificial intelligence and automation in the mining sector is going to make it possible to accelerate the velocity for opening mines up everywhere, uh, reduce the cost, reduce the labor portion, which is good and bad. I mean, it means no we're not going to put children in mines, we'll put robots in mines. I vote for the robots, but <laughs> it'll be it'll generate enough wealth that those children will go to school instead. So these are these are not crazy visions based on the technologies that I, I know exist, which I outline in my book. So I am optimistic that because the stuff exists, as people recognize that we can do that, I think they'll want to do it. And it doesn't mean that, that there aren't the weather won't do bad things to us. And, and I'm not going to argue whether there's more or less droughts or more or less rain. It's you're going to need more technology and money to deal with whatever happens. So that was sort of, And I'm optimistic about that because we, we're at a, a pivot point where the technology options are actually greater now than they've ever been. So all that's good. Uh, it just requires um, sort of a compromised mindset. I mean, if I were politically trying to compromise, advising people in the political sphere, which I used to do, is I wouldn't die in the hill of canceling wind credits, for example, or not subsidizing solar power in Africa. Go ahead. Just don't 
cancel the ability to produce oil and gas. I mean, it's the trade is let's do both. I, I think we're going to get to that trade, and and I would say we're going to get there sooner than I originally thought. Ironically, and this is the only silver lining in the Putin's uh, atrocities is because of what he's done in Ukraine. It's forced Europe to realize that the future is going to be a mix of both, and that, because that's what they're doing. So, I don't yeah. know. That's a good yeah. question because it, is, yeah. I have to defend the title somehow. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Somehow. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but there is there there is cause for optimism just because uh, you know people can make rational uh, decisions. Uh, uh, staying in the in the in the uh, uh, chat box because there are actually a number of interesting questions in there. Uh, there's one that asks, uh, uh, "What's the correlation between global CO2 and global warming over a long period?" I'm I'm not quite sure that's that's mm. that that's what we're talking about about here. Uh, but then uh, uh, follow ups. Uh, says that we've dodged the question in a previous episode. So so let me just clarify that right now. Um, the connection, physical connection between carbon dioxide and global temperature is very, very tenuous. And and uh, and and when people talk about climate change and CO2, um, they're not really talking from physical sense, despite all the amount of money that we're spending on climate models. But this leads us to uh, a, a question from, from Vicky asking about the status of the climate reparations concept for Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this just envisioned as charity that is money yeah. passed from Africa? For, or is there talk of allowing Africa to utilize fossil fuels to become wealthier? And and uh, we did cover this a little bit, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, the, the whole idea idea behind the uh, Kyoto protocols and the redistribution of wealth is to basically uh, buy off uh, Africa. Yeah. And and uh, the case of, of Namibia, where I am, is actually an interesting one, because no matter what, how much uh, the country reduces its carbon emissions, you're really? still talking about it's irrelevant because totally they irrelevant. Produce, produce, produce so little. And yeah. uh, the, they've basically been bought off to, uh, to uh, promise to not develop their own very uh, abundant natural resources and this is true throughout Africa you know there's been analyses done on the level of the uh, of the co continental level and it's the same yeah. kind of thing everywhere right. Right. you know Afri Africa is not a poor continent and uh, and uh, it, it can develop there's intelligent people here ambitious people and they're basically being told by the developed world no no you can't do what we did you know sorry anyway that that's where a lot of the uh, immorality I think comes in um, Let's go to the questions and answers now. Um, uh, so uh, J.A. Budd, he's the first one. Has there been any examination of society's advances in the context of changes in climate? Um, for example, testing various hypotheses like increased advances in society with increases in global temperature or elevated CO2 levels. So um, again, I, I think this is getting into an area that that is is kind of outside your your area of expertise, which is how yeah. you actually respond to a scenario. Never mind what the uh, what the actual cause of the, of, the, of the is, scenario is. This is this is it's, important. That's why I was you're absolutely yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Scenarios mm -hmm. don't matter. Yeah. It's, and I'm not arguing the scenarios. What mm -hmm. I'm arguing is when people say that the solution is build windmills, I'm, my, my observation is that you can't build enough and it's not, quote, the solution because of metallurgical coal to make the steel, because of the gas used to make the concrete, because of the polycarbonate, you know, hydrocarbons to make the plastic blades. It's not a solution and you can't run the world that way. Now, that's it's neutral to your opinions on climate change. And this is this is the part that's really important. People keep coming back to wanting to argue about the severity of our impact on the environment. Humans have an impact on the environment. CO2 is a warming gas, to you, as you all know. The complexities of how much it warms versus water vapor, versus methane, nitrogen oxides, all the rest, and forecasting now 100 years. Fascinating area of science. A lot of close friends who do research in this. It's totally irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the physics of batteries, the physics of electricity, nothing whatsoever to do with that. So I, I, I and it's a deliberate bifurcation because I think it's important. If, if, if it's true that we're going to cause something to happen that we want to 
mitigate, we should be honest about mitigation opportunities. One is resilience, and the other is to stop doing something. To stop doing something, my point is very simple. It's not possible. And that has nothing to do with what what the models say or don't say. It has nothing to do with the politics of climate change. It has nothing to do with how much money people are being bribed to, to say or not say, deniers not... And and I and it's very hard to get through through because people really want to come back to yeah but yeah but what about mm-hmm. the CO two okay CO two levels are higher they are the Earth is actually warmer this is this is not in dispute we, we just know it's half degree warmer roughly speaking it's not uniformly warmer the tropics are not half degree warmer the northern latitudes are that's not the I mean if you think about it, it's not global. <laughs> <laughs> the Antarctic is not as the Antarctic ice sheet has been growing, not shrinking. I mean, there's all kinds of confusing data, but they're irrelevant. They're a distraction from this mania to think that we can, let's go back to cars. So we can ban internal combustion engines and still operate society productively and have that result in some meaningful CO2 reductions. In fact, arithmetically, most people don't know this, but it's just an arithmetical fact. If we got the 500 million EVs that has 15, 15 million today, if we got the 500 million, if we had enough copper to do that by the year 2040, it would reduce the amount of oil the world uses by less than 10%. So this yeah. is not meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Even if you think we should re- eliminate oil use, this is not meaningful. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've I've gone to looking for most upvotes on the Q and A, uh, and <laughs> uh, Jermaine to uh, what you just mentioned. Uh, Dave Peters uh, asks, uh, so what do you do when you run out of copper, etc.? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens so, then? <laughs> so we actually know the answer to this question because the world does these things episodically. So think about yeah. commodities, whether it's metals, or food, all commodities, all all consumables have the same characteristic. I mean. You could argue the biggest achievement in, in history has been our ability to store consumables, whatever they are, electricity, water, food. Uh, some consumables are recyclable, by the way, like water. You keep reusing it. It doesn't go away unless you you know turn it into hydrogen and then, then becomes water again when you when you burn it. But anyway, some things are not recyclable easily. You know, food, once you eat it, grain is not readily recyclable. You can use the waste to fertilize fields, but you still have to grow food. Anyway, I digress. The, the ability to um, produce the quantity consumable society needs uh, in, in, in time and at a price we can afford is a miraculous accomplishment because it involves not only scales of production, but also storage, systems of planning and storage. We have to store everything. Everything gets, storage story is fascinating and human. The pharaohs knew we had to store grain, right? So we know when we screw up, when nature takes away a supply because of if rivers freeze, we can't get the copper or coal out or because of a drought. We know exactly what happens when you get a shortage of, of supply, any commodity, the price goes up. And when the it just goes up and it can go up a lot. Like in Europe, we've had prices go up one to 2000% of key energy commodities and fertilizer and food prices, specific foods. When prices go up, you get a behavioral change, right? People use less of it. They do other things or they do without until the point they can't. And then if it's food, you get starvation because the people who can afford it, buy it, and the people who can't don't get it and they die. Uh, when it comes to things like copper, the answer is you don't use it. Uh, it. If it's not there, you don't get to use it. So then you have a bidding war between the electric car company that needs copper, the plumbing company that needs copper pipes, the appliance company that needs copper, the computer company that needs copper. So the, the one that can afford to pay the most for it gets the limited supply. The cost of everything else goes up. The supply of it goes down, and people do without. You use the you use the the use the old thing longer. You repair it. That's a form of recycling. It's expensive, unpleasant. I mean, it's a long answer to we know. Uh, each one is a little different. Each one responds differently to the the price pressures. But the phenomenon is always the same. You can't do what you can't do. If there's not enough copper or food, it do, you can't use what doesn't exist. So the demand goes away somehow. Uh, and the demand the demand can go away painfully or just inconveniently. And sadly, if you do it to enough metal simultaneously, which is what we're doing, mm-hmm. and enough energy simultaneously, it's going to be really painful. That's yeah. that's the path we've charted for the world. That's not an optimistic observation, but I, I, but my optimism comes in people do markets do not like that. Yeah. Uh, systemic inflation 
it, everybody knows about inflation. We're now fueling a second round of inflation. It's not coming from printing money. It's coming from bad policies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ira Strauss uh, asked a fairly, um, fairly involved uh, question, but uh, basically it's, it's, um, what, how do you geoengineer the climate here? And uh, he, he speaks uh, yeah, yeah. about sunlight yeah. deflection by, yeah, yeah. By, uh, by by satellite reflectors. Uh, he's interested in your comments on this as an engineer. How does that compare with uh, other kinds of uh, solar geoengineering? Yeah. And, and then he also asks, uh, uh, what do you think full-scale carbon geoengineering that is sucking carbon out of the atmosphere will ever be feasible? And, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'd just like to comment on that second one when um when we're talking about that on a global scale i worry about global cooling actually but uh, um uh because uh, cooling is much you know, worse than warming in terms of i'd, say, I'd say so yeah there's no there's yeah. no comparison highly asymmetric no. as you know. exactly well, exactly sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is uh, at global levels is functionally impossible just yeah. full stop yeah. there's just no yeah. there's no path to that the only way you can scrub carbon dioxide mm. is at the point of production and yeah. and there and there that that merely increases the cost of energy two hundred percent. So yeah. if you want two hundred percent more expensive energy permanently, you scrub you scrub it at the point of production. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you can do. It's a chemical. Carbon dioxide is very reactive, uh, but when it's dispersed at parts per million, mm-hmm. in fact, it just in terms of turbulent flows, you can't pull it out of the atmosphere because mm-hmm. it, we can't move enough of the atmosphere. If you move enough of the atmosphere, you, you're creating you're creating uh, cyclones. Uh, yes. <laughs> literally, you can't. It, the physics doesn't work. The yeah. geoengineering is is a, is another word for hubris, by the way. So mm. in science fiction, which I dearly love, and I've probably read five thousand science fiction books, I love geoengineering uh, in science fiction. It doesn't happen in the real world. We don't know how to geoengineer. We can't. But if we could, there's the moral question, because when you're geoengineering, you're assuming that the, what we're going to do is cl- cool the whole planet, right? Maybe some parts of the planet don't want to be cooler. So who's going to be in charge of deciding that I'm going to unilaterally cool the planet? And the inverse say, well, why do we get to decide to heat the planet? Well, that's the science debate about whether we actually did it. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 core, the core fact is all this writing about geoengineering, and, you know, solar shields and yada, yada. This is really, uh, this is science fiction stuff. I'm sorry. And from an engineering yeah. perspective, just it just is. Yeah. Yeah, scales are yeah. astonishing yeah yeah i'm uh i'm i'm just looking at the time because i know that you do have another commitment coming up very soon but uh, let me just uh pick out a couple of, yeah. of questions yeah um Good. uh so so you are. Um, <laughs> martin hansen asks uh uh, about his Tesla vehicle, um, yeah. and, and so he said the, the the math he used suggests that my Tesla vehicle, with its 500 pound battery, has required no. five five hundred thousand pounds of overburden to be removed to be removed in mining. Is that correct? It's actually and a thousand it, pound battery. It's not 500. Yeah. He's, he he should look up uh, the text. text okay. Text. okay, but right. it does it does it's five hundred thousand pounds of combined overburden and ore to to make the minerals for the one battery. That's the average. It could be higher. Some parts of the world could be a million pounds. Yeah. Other parts yeah. could be a quarter million. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, Larry asks, um, uh, is there a good bibliography uh, that that uh, could uh, could be used to uh, to outline the material that you presented in in, sure. in our sideshow? <laughs> Did you say sideshow or slideshow? <laughs> no, 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 slideshow. Slide I'm just show, kidding. Yes. I'm just kidding. I know. So, I know. So, uh, the, the three uh, recent papers I did for Manhattan Institute, one, of the, um, they're at the MI website. And if you like, I'll, I'll send you the links uh, mm-hmm. and you can put them up. I, yeah. The most recent paper, um, the energy transition delusion, I did one on mines and minerals. And I did one about the uh, energy, tra- you know, um, the uh, magical thinking on the energy transition. Each of them uh, are, you know, data and graph centric. They're not long and they're 5,000 word papers and change, but all of them have about 100 plus citations and references to these kinds of data where, where I get these data. It's not me me making up the data. And if you go to the websites, either my Tech Pundit website or the Manhattan website, the articles I've published, which are all you know freeware, almost all my stuff is non fire you know a non paywalled sites. A few are paywalled. I have hyperlinks. So I, you know, the emissions issue about electric vehicles emitting more CO2 
uh, than people realize is that a TechCrunch article, which is a couple of years old, but the data haven't changed. Lots of hyperlinks in the article. So the bibliography is in that case in the hyperlinks. I wrote one for the National Academy of Sciences publication on the uh, energy emissions challenge of minerals, lots of hyperlinks and data. So, I, I mean, I, I try to go to primary sources to find these data, including IEA, but also, you know, technical journals. There's been a lot of work done on this stuff. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm a filter. I'm not, and I'm not trying to filter the primary data in a way that puts a finger on a scale. I try hard not to do that. Just I'm go hunting for facts like, how much energy does it take to dig up a, a ton of copper? Well, there's a lot of data on that, turns out. <laughs> and it's pretty wide range, but we know the data. We know the range. It's not zero. It's not infinite. So what's the range? When you look at the range, it's pretty shocking. Uh, so all that kind of data is is there. So that's a, the bibliography doesn't exist as a, you know, here's your reading list. I thought about doing that, by the way. Um, but it's, it gets off. It, the issues are so broad uh, you know, and it's so di 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 digressive. You go down all these rabbit holes. So I've never done it that way. You can yeah. find it in one of, th one of three reports and probably one of four or five articles have 80% of the data I cited uh, in primary sources. Okay. And, and, and and it's not hard to find. I mean, the, the citations yeah. are clearly identified. Yeah, yeah. And just one very quick question, uh, and then we can wrap up. Uh, this is from Terry. Uh, you know, as you, as you probably know, California regards itself as a world apart. And uh, and Terry's <laughs> curious to know it if is. you or any, anyone has done this analysis for California separately, especially in, in yeah. the context of the uh, proposed uh, bail on, or sorry, ban on internal combustion engines there mm. after 2030. Um, has anyone done this? Uh, looked at the impact uh, disproportionate impact of California policy on on how our nation goes uh, in uh, either yeah. responding to or mitigating yeah. or whatever for climate change well first California could cease to exist and consume you know zero hydrocarbons it wouldn't make no 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 difference to climate change well we just I mean it's a big economy it's you know big a big state but uh I think I and, I'll, uh, and I want to shoot from the hip here. I forgot I did the calculation. If if California went to zero hydrocarbon consumption, zero, I think in two years, China's growth alone wipes out all those savings just from their new coal plants. So it's sort of California should focus on China instead of themselves. But I did an article for City Journal uh, last year, earlier this year. Which I'll send. I'll send you so you have the link, Scott, at the website. Uh -huh. Looking at the answer to that question, uh, because California has done some work on it, and I did some looking at um, how many batteries would California have to build? What would they cost? Because they want to build lots of grid scale batteries, and they already are. They build more than anybody else in the country. They're building lots of solar and wind arrays, and that's their plan, and they're proceeding with it. So I I laid some of the numbers out uh, in economic terms, and you know it's it's not difficult. I also know that the California ISO, the Cal ISO, and the California Energy Commission have actually done these studies and published it. I mean, they've said recently that California should expect your electricity to get more expensive, not a little bit more. If I remember correctly, it's about a two or three hundred percent increase in electric costs. Yeah. And they pointed out that it will it will impact the low income houses the most, which of course the legislature will tax the rich and send checks to the poor. Okay, I mean you could do stuff like this, but they've they've actually said it so. They don't publicize it a lot, but if you sort of Google around Cal ISO and California Energy Commission, they've they've published the data. They know they know the engineering. Uh, so it's a lot of this stuff is not like it's there's some things that are actually impossible. Uh, they just are. Some things are just really silly, but they'll do them anyway, and it'll cost a lot of money. And I and I try to be hard to, to differentiate between the two because. California could decide to spend trillions of dollars on batteries. I mean, literally, it'll, it'll, if they keep going through, but it'll certainly be hundreds of billions of dollars on just batteries. Okay. I mean, they're, it's a rich state. They could, they could do that. And, and it would help. I mean, you've got the situation where your, your batteries make a big difference, your solar arrays. Mm -hmm. You do that because you don't have an option. California has an option, but they can do it. So I did the calculations. Uh, and it's sort of ironic. I mean, I'll point out in the article I wrote, the biggest, the world's biggest battery power plant, if you like, if you call it a power plant, it's a storage plant, is at Moss Landing in Northern California, well, mid, mid coast near Santa Cruz. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, it's a natural gas uh, site 
natural gas power plant site where they put a massive uh, battery array. I mean, it's enormous. It's, uh, I think it's 800 megawatt hours. It's really big. So they can, well, it's only minutes of electricity for California, literally minutes, but mm. you know, it's big. Uh, it ran for about three days and it shut down because it had a fire alarm. And if that ever goes on fire, you'll see it from, you know, you'll see it from Mars. It'll, you know, make a Tesla fire look like a, look like a bonfire. So, uh, it, you know, I don't think it's operating yet. That was a year ago as they properly are trying to assess why the fire alarms went off and and they'll fix it. They'll figure out why and they'll engineer safety systems. So I wrote about that, I guess, maybe a little sarcastically in the sense that it's ironic, but also positively that engineers are good. They'll figure out why and they'll fix it and they'll probably make it safe enough, but it's really expensive way to store, to store, uh, store energy. Uh, we're rich. We can store a lot more that way. Back to, I want to end on a point about Africa, the trade that we should be making if we want to help Africa is uncomplicated. We're willing to give Africans money. Okay, I'm I'm game. Uh, but I, I worry about, we have noticed from history, handing checks to people. When you, when you hand checks to people, they don't go to the people you want them to go to. So until we get microfinance worked out where the African citizens have a, a wallet of stable coins that you as a, as a donor, whether you're a person or a country can give that individual the, the money, which is coming. That That's going to happen. That's the biggest I mean, net good thing about cryptocurrencies, by the way, is that when we have a stable cryptocurrency, and there will be one eventually, I can I can donate money to people you know. You could let me know, mm-hmm. Scott, these 12 people could really use 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or whatever. Boom, they'll get it. That second, it'll be them. Nobody yeah. can take it from them. No intermediary, no no sticky fingers. But until that happens, uh, they need cheap energy and cheap food. So mm. the, the moral trade, I come back to my to my my trade is why don't we why don't we just spend more money on our stuff? Let's just deprive ourselves of a little extra wealth by spending more money on our energy. Okay. You want to drive an electric car? I'm not, I don't want to subsidize you for that. What what I want you to do is I want you when you buy your electric car to you know make sure the Africans get cheap oil for their for their car because it's much much cheaper. The cheapest yeah. electric car is twice the price of the cheapest new gasoline car. I want to send them used gasoline cars or cheap new ones to let them have mobility, to let them grow, to let them. I mean, if all of Africa couldn't couldn't emit enough CO two to begin to make a difference to these models we should help them yeah yeah a, a great a great moral good now we also we should help the poor in our country mm-hmm. that'd be nice um, yes and what we're doing is impoverishing everybody by policies that have a lot of stickiness in the kleptocracy uh, there's a lot of intermediaries in this in these uh, reparations and a lot of a lot of overhead and management and i think most people recognize that this is uh, that's a fact uh, there, there's a lot of dishonest people in that system. If we can get rid of the intermediaries, we can help a lot of people, free up a lot of money. But that's not the that's not the trade we're making. The trade we're making is this higher virtual signaling moral good that if I recycle plastics, I've helped Africans. Please yeah. stop yeah. that. That's just we know it's not true. Yeah. Well, on that uh, soberingly optimistic note, uh, <laughs> let me let me close because I know you have to go someplace else. So, well, Elon uh, Musk I, is going to give us Starlink, which will bring as and Bezos the same thing, and that will mean my optimism about Africans having stable coins in their smartphones will become real. They won't have to depend on a uh, on a on an unreliable internet, and I can talk to them and help them. I'm looking it, forward to that day, and that's going to come soon. That day cannot come too soon, in my view. So, um, so thank you, Mark, uh, for for joining us for a very stimulating discussion. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions uh, uh, to, today, but uh, let me just uh, again thank you and remind everyone that this is the last uh, Restoring the Sciences uh, webinar for the calendar year. Uh, we'll resume on January 6 with Professor Ute Dykman of uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel. Uh, we will be having a special. Event 
event coming up on January, not January 6th, in one week from today, uh, highlighting one of our National Association of Scholars uh, reports that's uh, coming out on intrusion of diversity in the sciences uh, and the science universities. So, Mark, uh, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, uh, there'll be a uh, live, oh, well, sorry, the, they'll, this live stream will be available on YouTube uh, very shortly after we're done here. But uh, again, thank you, Mark, for joining us. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Scott. We really appreciate it. Okay. Good okay. luck. Yeah. Do, Thank do well you. In Africa. <laughs> I'm trying.